Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for my regular Monday this and that video. And what these are, if you're new, is just a way that I can keep you updated on things that are going on around here. Something that is more current to the time from the time I actually shot the video. So typically I shoot these videos on a Thursday and then they publish on the following Monday where all the rest of my videos can be three to four weeks even longer out. And sometimes I'll switch them around depending on what I think should publish sooner. But yeah, that's just a way I stay ahead on stuff. And then the other purpose of these videos is that if I'm talking about topics that I already have detailed videos out on is I will link you back to them in the description box down below or I'm giving you a bit of a teaser of a video that's yet to come. Don't forget at the end of this video to open up that description box by clicking on either show more right down here below my channel name or that little gray arrow you'll see over on this side if you're on a smart device so that you can find all the links and so on that I'll be putting in there. So let's get started on the topics of today. You may have seen the community post where I showed the picture of the pumpkins and the pan and so on and so forth because I decided finally this year, I've been meaning to do it for years, to go ahead and dehydrate up some of my pumpkin. And I'll be doing a more detailed video on this down the road, but I'm going to give you enough information to get you started on this. So what I did was I baked the, the pumpkins first and by just putting them in a big pan. And I just put it on my wood stove because in the wintertime, everything gets done on the wood stove. But obviously, if you don't have a wood stove, put it in your conventional oven. I can't really tell you the time, but I do just put some water in the pan so it doesn't burn and then bake it and check on it. You just want to get it to where it's soft enough that you can mash it a little bit. And then if you choose choose to pure, puree it first, that's going to be entirely up to you. But if you're going to powder it anyway, there's really no need to puree it first. So what I did was once it got baked soft enough where I could scoop it all out of the skins and then spread it onto my silicone trays that I got from my new uh, dehydrator, the Kasori, because I decided I do want to do this. I did want to do this in the dehydrator rather than next to the wood stove. And I'll explain why when I do that other video down the road. But anyway, so I just I just mashed it out and spread it out onto the silicone trays and then dehydrated it. It took about 10 to 12 hours around in there. I don't know exactly. I rarely ever go higher than 115 degrees, especially using the silicone trays. Now, silicone, generally speaking, is safe, but when you start using it in a heated form, you got to be careful of your temperatures because there's still not enough information on how safe it is baking and cooking in it. So to me, 115 degrees is going to be safe for everything all the way around. It's not going to overdo your foods, your herbs, and so on. And so that to me, it's just always a, a pretty safe setting. And then I don't have to worry about the silicone getting overheated as well. I started off with just using the coffee grinder I bought just for powdering stuff, as you can see in this photo. And that does work really good, but because I'm doing so much, I had to do several runs on it and it only holds so much at a time that the next batch I did I actually use the blender so you can do either way you can use a coffee grinder you can use a blender sometimes a coffee grinder will powder it up better now when I did the spaghetti squash that's what this is right here I used the blender for that and it didn't powder it up quite as well but I was doing a whole bunch at a time and I wasn't really concerned about it being fully powdered. I just wanted to get it small enough that I could get it all into the jar and it would be you know take up less room that way rather than putting the flakes in there like I do with the tomatoes. Now when I first put this in here here's what it looked like here's the picture you can see it's a little more full it's, it was I think about halfway full and that represented two pie pumpkins <laughs> right there. And I took two pie pumpkins, one was on the bigger side, one was average size, powdered them up and they made, they only filled up a pint sized jar halfway. So that's only a half pint of powder. And so that shows you how much less space they take up in storage. And now I'm probably going to be doing this from now on with the powders because just a little bit I've been working with it. I am so pleased with both the spaghetti squash and the pumpkin powder. So not only does it take up about a quarter of the amount of space, actually maybe about a fifth of the amount of space in your food storage than canning or freezing would, the flavor of the powders on both the spaghetti squash and the pumpkin powder 
intensifies just by dehydrating it. Even once you rehydrate it to where it should be, which rehydrates beautifully, by the way, you can make it just like it was if it was fresh, but the flavor is more intense. So I was thrilled with that. So yesterday I did take some of the spaghetti squash powder and <laughs> some of its flakes and then added a little bit of water. So my guess on this was about one part powder to four parts water and it was a pretty good guess. I still could have added just a little bit more water but that's all going to be dependent on the consistency you want your squash when you go to cook it or eat it or use it in baked goods. And I cooked that up and I was just amazed at the flavor of the spaghetti squash. Now obviously you're going to use lose that stringy texture which I don't care. I don't mind it when it's fresh but when it's dried I did try doing it as flakes and it kept some of the stringy texture but it wasn't the same as the way it was when you bake a spaghetti squash fresh the, that's a better texture for if you want to use it as a pasta replacement for spaghetti but in this case i'm just looking at squash the reason i grow spaghetti squash is because it's one of the ones that produces best for us and the flavor of this was amazing after dehydrating it i love the flavor of spaghetti squash anyway but after dehydrating it and then reconstituting it and cooking it for just a few minutes on the wood stove the flavor got very sweet. It surprised me. It was very sweet. And I noticed the pumpkin does the same thing. So, so far with the pumpkin, I've done two things with it. And that is I've made some pumpkin pancakes. I think I put, I started off with two tablespoons of the pumpkin powder. Then I think I added another one just to get more flavor in there. And then I added some spices like some nutmeg and cloves and cinnamon. And then just did my reg regular blend and mixed it up and baked it when I say regular blend it's it's not I, I rarely follow any exact recipe for pancakes I just throw it together and in that one I did use all whole wheat flour and they turned out really really good the grandbaby was here and he really loved it and then the other thing I did the day before was I made some pumpkin spice oatmeal which the grandbaby was here for that too and he also loved that he couldn't stop eating it so that was those are my experiments so far but just from the little bit i've done i can tell that this would that either of these would be great in using in pie even the spaghetti squash powder because of the naturally sweet flavor it took on after dehydrating you could probably even mix them together so maybe you didn't grow enough pumpkins to suit your needs you could just dehydrate up any squash and get the same results and it and because it rehydrates so beautifully and you can make the exact consistency you want the possibilities are really endless so i plan on using the pumpkin powder and making pumpkin pies pumpkin bread and whatever suits my fancy oh yes and also pumpkin spice creamsicles i do make those for patrick every so often so i plan on doing that so this was just my sampling getting started on that and uh, i have several more squash to go through but I've got, I ordered up some more of the silicone sheets for my kasori so I could totally fill it up with squash. So I'm waiting for those to come in and get a whole bunch dehydrating up. And one thing I do want to say real quick is somebody said, why would you want to do that when, you, when winter squash can keep forever in cold storage? Yes, it does. And we have cold enough rooms in the house like where I've got the spaghetti squash and pumpkins right now that they would last all winter. They would last at least clear through spring but i'm trying to make space that's okay up through thanksgiving having those out because they're a nice little decoration but there comes a point where it's like okay i need my counter cleaned off i need more space to work with again and so initially i was going to can but i decided to try the dehydrating and now that's what i'm doing because i love how the flavor turns out and it's going to take up so much less space and be lighter weight as well then the other powder i just created this is the first time i've done this with my own peppers so i have i grew the chinese five color peppers did also just start selling the seeds on my store by the way but this year what i did after i put enough up in the freezer so I can use them right away kind of in a more of a fresh form for stir fries and such I decided to take the rest and just let them dry by the wood stove so I brought in a batch oh, about a month ago and they've been drying and I decided I was going to start selling the seeds and so what I did was the other day I started breaking open the dried pods 
and taken the seeds out so I could put them up on the store and then took the dry the pods that were already dried and just powdered them up so I could make my own pepper powder for whatever. I thought initially about just flaking them, but then I decided I wanted to powder it. And the reason why was because I left the stem, not the stems, but the tops on the peppers. I didn't take those out. I just powdered them right up with that. So if I had just flaked them, I would have ended up with chunks in there when I go to use it. But in this way, I could use those tops. I did throw the stems out, but I could use the tops and just mix them all in there. And I tell you, this is nice and spicy right here. So the Chinese five color, if you're new to what they are, they're a little pepper about this big. And I love them so much because not only do they grow really well for us, they're just beautiful. I misunderstood when I first started growing them. I thought that each pepper would come in on the plant as a different color. That's not how it works. The pepper actually starts out with a purple flower and then a purple pepper, not green. It comes in purple, real deep purple. And then once it gets to full size, it starts to progress through the other four colors. And there's actually more than just four colors, but four basic colors. But since there's all these stages of progression, they can be anywhere in between those in shade. So it goes from purple, then to the cream color, then from there to yellow, then orange and the final color is red and so even if you pick them in all those different colors if you bring them in and let them dry naturally they will eventually all turn red and that's why the pepper powder is the color it is and you would think it would be less red than this if i had had all those other colors but because all the peppers were red by the time they finished drying and I powdered them up, that's why it turned that color. So I have a bunch more to do, so I'm definitely going to be filling this up. I love these things, and I highly recommend, if you like hot peppers, trying these out, because there's just so many great benefits. They're, they're hotter than a jalapeno. I don't know where they rate as far as hotness goes on the scale, but I would say they're hotter than jalapenos for sure. And just, they're so pretty. <laughs> And I also have a recipe I did on a fermented hot sauce I made out of them, I think two years ago, that I'll link to down below. So anyway, be watching for that video I'll have coming out down the road. I plan to shoot either today or in a couple of days about the pumpkin powder, the spaghetti squash powder, and really that will apply to any squash that you grow that you want to dehydrate up and then ways that you can use it. So let's move on to some other topics. Some of you may have noticed right here, my roasting pan came in, my stainless steel one. So if you remember a couple of videos back, a couple of this and that videos, I was talking about the roasting pan that was my grandmother's and it's ugly. Let me tell you, it's not a pretty pan, but it dawned on me this year that it was aluminum and that's one of the many things. I thought I'd got rid of all my aluminum bakeware. Since I only use that roasting pan once a year, twice at most, I forgot about that and I got to looking at it. I'm like, this is aluminum. It's bigger than this one, but I thought, you know what? It's time, I should do this now while I can to replace this with a stainless steel because I everything has been switched out to either cast iron, stainless steel, or glass through the years. And some people were saying, oh, you could repurpose it by making it into this or that or hanging it on your wall. Well, the pan is ugly. <laughs> it's got a broken handle. It's aluminum. Aluminum's not, and it's, it's, I don't know how many years old and it's beat up and dented. And so, no, I'm not gonna use it as decor. And no offense, I appreciate the ideas. Even though I love the fact that it was my grandmother's and she and, and I inherited it from her, it's not that precious to me that I can't just let Patrick use it in his shop for washing tools or collecting oils when he changes out the oils in his different machines. So it's still gonna be used for something, but not for decor. But anyway, this pan finally came in and I'm really happy with it. Now it wasn't cheap, but by chance, I ended up getting it for free, and no, not as a promotion. And I'll explain that in a minute. So anyway, I'm very happy with it. This is the lid. The lid can be used as a pan, and it's on its own. I'll probably never do that. My whole purpose is, is I've always cooked my turkeys, chickens, and stuff was in a pan where I could put a lid on it, and I don't have to worry about covering it with aluminum foil. Yes, I know it's aluminum foil. Sometimes I still call it tin foil. It's just a habit. So I, you know, again, trying to get away from using aluminum, that includes the foil. But I'm really happy with it. It's, it's pretty. I think I'm going to find myself using this for a lot more things. It does fit on my wood stove, so this is actually a better size as far as that goes. 
Uh, the other one didn't fit on my wood stove with all the other stuff. Well, I could make it fit, but I'd have to pretty much move everything else off, including my big pot of water I always have on there. I can see this coming in handy for a lot of things, such as making a big pot of chili for canning and so on. I'm pretty pleased with it so far. So then the other thing I got to go with it when I saw this was even available is I was needing a new turkey baster anyway. My other one was just... I, I mean, I didn't even have one this last year because it was just, the rubber on it was all nasty and I don't even know what happened to the plastic part to it. Then I happened to see they actually have stainless steel ones and I was thrilled because that always bothered me sucking up that hot liquid into a plastic thing. Plastic's not all bad, but when you're talking about anything where you're going to keep it either frozen or it's going to get hot, especially in a microwave, you got to avoid plastic and so I was thrilled to see this came in stainless steel and the other cool thing about it and some of you probably already know these exist I didn't even know but it came with a its own little scrubber and it came with a couple of injectors where you can actually inject the liquids into the turkey itself so I thought that was a pretty neat idea so anyway, all that just, you can fit all that stuff inside there and keep it all together and not have to worry about losing it when you're not using the thing. So I thought that was pretty cool. So now let me talk real quick about how I ended up not having to pay anything for this. A lot of you know I'm an Amazon associate. So what that means is anytime you purchase anything through the Amazon links, and this goes for any channel that isn't an Amazon associate, if they have Amazon links, then what that means is when you purchase through that you click on that link, Anything you buy during that shopping session gets credited to that person and they make a small commission off it. It doesn't even matter what you buy. It doesn't even have to be the item that you clicked on. It could be something entirely different. So at any rate, because, you know, we all know Jeff Bezos, Amazon, evil, wicked, blah, blah, blah. Well, I think a lot of people also forget that there are good, honest people that actually earn an income from Amazon. It's not all just supporting one big, you know, one percenter out there. You're actually helping other people too. You got to make your own choices that suit you, but don't put people down because they're not following your personal moral compass. Just know that whether it be you're helping to support your favorite YouTube channel or even a small business based out of your own country, like the handcrafted bowls and mugs that I bought. That's a guy from, I think he's from Utah, right here in the US, handmade products. He sells them on Amazon and they're beautiful and I love them. And so I'm supporting him and that's how I look at it. But at any rate, so I just just want to say that before people start, you know, coming in and dogging on me again about Amazon. But that's where we get some, that's where we earn some of our income to be able to stay here on YouTube and keep doing what we're doing. So to the main point of this, one of the many reasons I do like shopping on Amazon is if, let's say you bought something through Amazon and it ended up being something like lids that were, that claimed to be ball lids that are made in the USA and they weren't, Amazon will take care of you. I've never, in all the many years I've shopped with Amazon in the, the several times I've had something go wrong, Amazon has always covered it always no questions asked they just take care of it like that well what happened with this is it was supposed to be in last week and i got these notifications on amazon saying your package may be lost you can go ahead and apply for a refund and i'm like ah darn i really wanted that pan and this was the last in this size by the way so i thought well i'll look i'll shop around for, see if i can find another one similar to it in the same size and i went ahead and put in for the refund I, and they refunded it immediately no questions asked well the pan ended up showing up at my doorstep the very next day and then i felt kind of bad because i already got refunded and i'm like do i should i ship this back what should i do i don't want to ship it back because i want this pan and there wasn't any more in this size left and so what happened as i got on there i i got into the chat on there which can be a little difficult to find it takes several steps and i can never remember how to do it until i get in there and start messing around and just told them the whole scenario. This is what happened. I wouldn't have put in for a refund if I would have known it was going to show up the very next day. I said, what should I do? And so what they did was they told me just to go ahead and keep it and the refund too, just as a thanks. And wow, that was pretty generous considering that I paid $130 for this pen. And I got, and then I got a refund for it because it didn't show up when it was supposed to. 
and they thought it had been lost and you know that happens sometimes packages get lost so anyway let's move on to the a couple couple more topics before i close out this video one is you'll see back here i have a collection of some gluten-free items you remember in my last video i was talking about uh starting to get back into some gluten-free baking we're not gluten-free and don't need to be but we have some friends that are and now that we spend and since we spend quite a bit of time with them and we eat together with them i want to get back into that and start creating more gluten-free recipes so as such i've been restocking some of my different gluten-free flours and adding more to it so i've got some brown rice flour which i have used before i have some buckwheat flour i have sweet rice flour never used that before so that'll be new i don't know what the difference is yet between that and just regular white rice flour i've got more coconut flour i've used coconut flour for a long time it's really great especially for using in sweeter type things pancakes muffins and so on and then one of the very new things and by the way psyllium powder that comes from plantain typically it's going to come from your plantain so if you're already growing plantain then you know you can make your own psyllium powder but i went ahead and bought this because our plantain's done for this season and all that we've collected all the seed that's for our store that's for selling so i figured i'd go ahead and buy that this is one of the many things you can use to replace the gluten that will take place of gluten when you're working with your different breads to give them that texture that they need, especially when you're talking yeast breads. I do have a collection of gluten-free recipes or recipes where I give you uh, options for gluten-free, where you can easily just substitute this for that, a one-to-one -one ratio. So I'll link to that. I did find and get it compiled into a playlist. I might still have more out there. Anyway, so uh, one more thing I wanted to cover was, some of you have heard me talk about the Dr. Jacobs soap. Now I do make my own bar soap and I used to sell them on my store but summer of 2020 I had to just quit doing that because I couldn't keep up on that and then little by little I've cut back on other things for the store because I can't keep up because I keep getting busier. So I thought I would try out the, the Dr. Jacobs soap and I did a video just on this, the soap in general and it's many uses that I'll link to in the description box down below. And one of the things I do use it for is in my homemade shampoo or sometimes I just use it as is i do water it down and in that video i tell you the ratio of water to soap i was reluctant to try the rose i like the smell of rose but sometimes certain things I, I know a lot of you know what i'm talking about it's just too perfumey too strong and somebody told me they tried the rose and they used it on their hair and they loved it and so i thought i'm gonna give it a try so i went ahead and ordered up the rose and I tried it on my hair today. I didn't mix it in with my herbal tea. I just diluted it way down and then used it on my hair like I normally would. And I love it. It's the smell is it's not overpowering. It's not too perfumey. It's just this nice light rose smell that actually does stay in your hair, but it's not at all overpowering. And by the way, I do have it's always in the description box below. I do have a link that is an affiliate link with Dr. Jacobs because after I tried them, I liked them so much, much better than the Dr. Bronner's that I asked them if they did affiliates and, and uh, they decided to work with me. And so that's really great because you can go through that link and you can save some money. And then that also does help us out a little bit too because we get a little bit of commission off that just like we do with the Amazon links. You can also buy some of these soaps you can get from Costco. You don't get as much. You get a package of four at least last I looked, but you don't have as many different options. And I think somebody said some of the box stores sell this for a pretty good price. So uh, you can look there too if that's going to save you some more money. And I'm totally fine with that. I appreciate everybody's support, but I also understand the need to save money. So if it can save you 10 cents or a couple dollars, I get it. You got to do what you got to do to better your situation while still being able to save as much as you can. Because every little bit you save is something that you can put towards adding more to your food storage and so on okay well i hope you enjoyed this video and don't forget to check out the links in the description box down below and share some of your thoughts on any of the things i talked about have you been dehydrating pumpkin and other types of squash and what have you been using it in and thanks for watching take care and god bless <music>